pay. Pay bills, deposit checks, earn points with every debit card purchase, and more. With F&M's electronic and mobile access, how you bank on the go is your choice. F&M Bank, your money, smart choice. Online at myfmbank.com, equal housing lender, member FDIC. Made to order, never frozen Midwest beef served on a toasted buttery bun is just the beginning at Culver's of Clarksville. The experience crescendos into fresh homemade custard that you can customize into delectable treats like sundaes, banana splits, or one of their signature concrete mixers. You'll be treated like family and fed like royalty at Culver's of Clarksville near Exit 4 just off Wilma Rudolph Boulevard at 140 Southampton Place. Culver's of Clarksville, welcome to delicious. Attention cord, Attention cutters. cord cutters. You don't have to choose between the channels you love and the convenience of wireless streaming anymore. Streaming is here. CDE Lightband now offers fiber fast streaming services. Enjoy all the channels you're used to from your big channel lineup now over streaming. Sign up now and receive a free Amazon 4K Fire Stick. Our affordable packages start at just $62.95 and all packages have 250 megabits per second of internet included. Call 648-8151 and save when you make the switch to CDE like bands. Some restrictions apply. Free gift offers only available to new streaming customers. Taxes and fees will apply. This is Grace and Truth Radio. We are back, baby. After a two-week uh, hiatus, we are so thrilled to be back with you. Uh, we come to you on the Lord's Day, Lord willing, at 8 a.m. on 105.1 FM and 105.5 FM at 11 a.m. and 1400 a.m. also at 11 a.m. They are all the wolf, and we are all grace and truth. Thank you for being with us. My name is Jason Sage. I am the minister with the North 2nd Street Church of Christ in Clarksville, Tennessee. Uh, and we are back after... A brief period away, just the way a couple things worked, uh, some technical, some planned, some unplanned, uh, we were not able to bring you new shows, so we are back with you, and we, we've we missed you. Uh, I, it's uh, been good. You know, we're in this uh, separated period of time when uh, most of the congregations of which I, which I am aware uh, are worshiping virtually. We're certainly doing that on Facebook uh, at the North 2nd Street Church of Christ, and uh, it's just one of those things where you're really conscious of the fact that we're not around each other as much as we used to. Uh, we're not going to get to see everybody's smiling face and be encouraged by each other's presence and spirit. And uh, it's just good to be back. And hopefully, uh, hopefully this show, you can say after the show is over, <laughs> that it was good that we were back. Let's hope that happens. Uh, we're going to talk about some neat things today. Uh, we're going to ask, what is the point? Uh, why, why bother doing some of the things that we do? What is the point? We're going to take a look at a proverb of the day uh, from Proverbs chapter 10. That's going to be fantastic. Uh, and then we're going to talk about baptism hypotheticals. Have you ever talked to someone and they'll throw a question at you and it's designed to kind of put you back on your heels or, or make you question what you believe? We'll talk about some of those things coming up a little bit later in the show. Uh, all that is coming up, but as you know, what time it is. Ah, uh, those soothing sounds mean it's time for something good, something to build us up, something to think about how good we have it in Jesus Christ. We call it something good. Tell me something good. Tell me something good. Our something good for today comes uh, from a couple of different places, but I want to get across one idea. Uh, it really starts in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, a familiar verse to us. That's the last chapter of the book. And we all know those verses. The whole uh, of the matter has been discussed. Uh, what then is the whole duty of man to fear God and keep his commandments? We, we know that verse by heart. But in that same chapter, uh, Solomon talks about the idea that remember our creator in the days of our youth. And he talks about before our death. And in that phrase, he says, when the body returns to dust and the spirit returns to God who gave it. And that's what I want to talk about here today. Because uh, I know for me, and I think for most Christians, we are yearning for that day when we get to hug each other's neck, when we get to shake hands, when we get to be with one another, when we get to, to sing as a congregation and meet with one another as a congregation and do all those things and pray together. 
I, I'm so fired up about it, I'm, I'm getting excited right now. And I, I know several of our members have expressed that same idea. Well, there is a sense in which we need to take that feeling that we have and understand how we should feel about heaven. And i tell you what I mean in that same idea. So in, in us is the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God, for the believing Christian, for the believing Christian, the Spirit of God dwells in them. There is this idea that God's Spirit longs to be reunited, longs to be back in heaven, longs to be back in its natural state, so or his natural state, so to speak. And I'll give you a couple of verses on this. I want to start in Romans chapter 8. And the idea here is uh, we should think of ourselves as longing for heaven. Uh, God has given us his spirit as a deposit, and that spirit longs to be joined together, longs to be uh, in heaven with the Father. So look at Romans chapter 8. Now here, Paul is talking about the idea that the creation, uh, and several people, you can uh, have some slightly different interpretations about whether the creation means mankind or uh, the earth in general, but that that's not our point. Uh, what I want to look at there is verse 22 and 23. It says, For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. So that's that idea of the creation. Now he's going to turn it on us. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. So what's Paul saying? The, the Christian who's in tune with the Holy Spirit dwelling within them, we should think of ourselves as longing for heaven. The, the family relationship that we have in our churches, right? That's what makes us long for being together. We have these uh, uh, emotional feelings for one another, this, this love that we have. And what does that make us want to do? We, we want to be together. We want to see each other. Well, what about ourselves with heaven? What about the Spirit that dwells within us with God? We have this little down payment of heaven, this little down payment of the spiritual life in our lives, and hopefully it grows in us as we whittle away more of what is not God in our lives and turn to him more fully. So Paul in Romans chapter 8 says that spirit inside us groans seeking to be reunited, seeking to be brought to fruition in the kingdom of God in heaven. Well, now look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Because Paul is going to talk about the same thing. He's going to talk about the difference between our body and our spirits. And not only our spirit, but the spirit of God that dwells within us. Let's read the scripture for its language. For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent, now let me stop right there. Paul is referring to our bodies. Our earthly bodies will pass away, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, will return to dust. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. If indeed by putting it on we may not be found naked, for while we are still in this tent we groan, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now for those of you familiar with the passage, this is probably reminding you of the language of 1 Corinthians 15, as well it should. So what Paul is saying here is this physical earthly body will not inherit the kingdom of God. We're going to be changed in some way. We're, we're going to have a, a different kind of form. Uh, Paul talks about that. If you haven't studied that before, take a look at 1 Corinthians 15. But there is this groaning in us, not to be naked, he says, not to be free of this body, but, but to be joined with God in heaven in the new body that we will have. Now look at verse 5, and here's the point. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. It is that Spirit inside of us, of God, that groans to be back united fully with God. In this present world, God's Spirit is joined to us, and that's a mystery we cannot completely understand. People try to uh, put, uh, you know, kind of definite hedges around what that means. We shouldn't try to do that. We just need to read the Word of God and accept what it says. That the baptized believer has the Spirit. The Spirit groans to be with God. And we should as well. So here's the point. Here's the something good. You know how you feel about coming together for worship again? 
You know how you feel about that family relationship you have with your fellow Christian. You can't wait to see them and hug their neck and be one with them again. There's a little part of God in each and every believing Christian that's doing the same thing. And we need to tune into that desire. We need to realize that we have a family relationship with God, that God has given us his spirit as a guarantee of that relationship. And we need to seek God and groan for heaven and cannot wait for the time when we are joined together, not just singing praises on this earth, but singing praises directly to the Lamb, directly to the Father, that we'll be joined together in a way that we cannot imagine. Do we groan to be together in spirit in this world? Yes. Do our spirits join, groan to be joined together in heaven? Yes. Are you ready to go to heaven? Are you excited? Are you groaning for it? Can you not wait for that family relationship to be restored? What a blessing it is to be a Christian. What hope there is in that emotion, that feeling, that excitement, that spiritual groaning for heaven. Are you ready to be reunited with your father? Children, are you ready to come home? That is the message of the gospel. That is the message of hope that is brought forth through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Paid the price so that we may have this hope and groaning for heaven, that we may indeed be called children of God. That's the best I got. If that's not something good for you today, I just don't know what I can do. I know what I will do. We'll talk about baptism hypotheticals. We'll ask what's the point, and we'll take a look at the book of Proverbs when we come back with more grace and truth. James 127 is a clear directive for Christians to help widows and orphans. We do very well helping widows, but what about orphans? Many Christian families would love to adopt, but cannot afford the $25,000 to $30,000 cost. Sacred Selections is a nonprofit foundation designed to help. 100% of your donations go directly to help finance an adoption. Sacred Selections has helped 119 families adopt children. SacredSelections.org, helping Christians help the helpless. I'm a 40-year-old man that walked in there to get his high school diploma. It was very hard for me, but Miss Araceli, she gave me direction. At age 47, Marco finished his high school diploma. 50% of getting your high school diploma is walking through those doors. The other 50% is doing the work. No one gets a diploma alone. If you're thinking of finishing your high school diploma, you have help. Find free adult education classes near you at finishyourdiploma.org. That's finishyourdiploma.org. Brought to you by the Dollar General Literacy Foundation and the Ad Council. In the Bible, the word for church simply means a group of people. The Church of Christ that meets on North 2nd Street in Clarksville is just that. We're a group of people spreading the love of Jesus, worshiping God, and seeking Him through His Spirit-revealed Word. Our Bible studies are simple and offered for all ages. Our worship is intended to praise God and encourage His saints. Our worship starts at 10 and 5 on the Lord's Day. Find out more at northsecondcofc.org. Find the love of Jesus at the North 2nd Street Church of Christ. Every day I wake up at 5 to give Dad his medicine. Every day I wake up at 5 to give Dad his medicine. At 6 I make his breakfast. Every day I wake up at 5 to give Dad his medicine. At 6 I make his breakfast. At 7 I shower. Every day I wake for up at 5. For those caring for a loved one, we hear you. That's why AARP created a community to help us better care for ourselves and the ones we love. Visit aarp.org slash caregiving. Brought to you by AARP and the Ad Council. All right, welcome back into the show. This is Grace and Truth Radio. I got so excited at the beginning of the show, I didn't tell you who I am. <laughs> uh, my name is Jason Sage. I'm the minister with the North 2nd Street Church of Christ in Clarksville, Tennessee. Still in business, still doing God's work. Since I've been with you last, we've had a baptism. One of our uh, young uh, men there uh, was baptized at home. Man, uh, praise God what good things can happen. Uh, the Word of God is not shackled. It is not quarantined. Uh, it is uh, living and powerful and breathing and moving and tells us about Jesus Christ and convicts us of our sin and tells us what we need to do to be saved and praise God. Uh, all right, now, I'm getting excited again. It's, it's been a couple of weeks. If you don't know anything about me, uh, I'm easily excited, <laughs> uh, and I'm glad to be with you. But I want to remind you uh, that we are meeting online. I don't know if your congregation is. If they are, I encourage you to assemble with the saints where you are located virtually. I, I encourage you to do that. Uh, but if not, you're welcome to come join us 
Uh, we're on Facebook. Uh, and, of course, uh, if you know anybody who's uh, been doing that lately, Facebook has really been struggling, as every church in America and every Christian seems like uh, logs on to Facebook Live between 9 and 10 in the morning on a Sunday. Uh, but uh, as far as the technical things work out, uh, we do our 9 a.m. Bible study just as if it were normal. Uh, we just do it, uh, we just assemble together uh, virtually. At 10 a.m., we do worship service uh, on Sundays. And then on Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock, we do our Bible study just like normal. We're really trying to maintain uh, not only the sense of assembling together because we do the things at the same time and uh, in the same spirit. Uh, but we're also just trying to kind of maintain that schedule of our church life. So uh, join us for that. You can find our Facebook page by typing in your space bar, uh, North 2nd, spell it out, uh, S-E-C-O-N-D, North 2nd Street Church of Christ. And you should be able to find our live feed there. If you have any questions, contact me through the Grace and Truth uh, 1400 uh, page on Facebook. It, wh however it is we can get to you. Just let us know. We'll be glad to have you. All right, uh, coming up on the show today, we're going to talk about baptism hypotheticals. We're going to ask, what is the point of all this? Why bother to worship? Why bother to do those things? That's all coming up. But right now, it's time to see what happens when we go back in time. Today's proverb is brought to you by Solomon, wiser than you for nearly 3,000 years. Proverbs chapter 10 is where we're going to begin today. I thought this was a fitting kind of thing to uh, kick back off our shows after a couple of weeks off. And, and just so you know, uh, for the few of you who do watch our show on video, we have a YouTube feed that we also put on our Facebook page. Uh, if you notice that I'm in a different position, uh, it's because we've thrown a plastic tarp over John Michaels. Uh, I don't know if I'm protecting him from me or he's protecting him, uh, me from him, uh, but we are practicing social distancing. It's the social distancing edition of Grace and Truth Radio. All right, now back to Proverbs. Uh, and if you're familiar with the book, the first nine chapters of the book of Proverbs are kind of this long narration, this waxing eloquent on the difference between uh, wisdom that calls or foolishness or the adulteress that calls. And that's all fantastic, but it's not exactly what we think of when we think of a proverb. When we think of a proverb, we think of these uh, couplets, these two-line phrases. And if you notice in chapter 10, that's really when the book, as we, as most of us think about it, uh, begins. In fact, it even has a little heading there. It says the Proverbs of Solomon. So it's as if the first nine chapters are an introduction thematically to what's going on. And then here we go with the actual Proverbs. And that's where I want to begin today. In Proverbs chapter 10, and let me read verses 1 through 3, uh, and then we'll skip down through the book a little bit and see what we can find today. It says this in Proverbs 10.1, the Proverbs of Solomon, a wise son makes a glad father, but a foolish son is a sorrow to his mother. Treasures gained by wickedness do not profit, but righteousness delivers from death. The Lord does not let the righteous go hungry, but he thwarts the craving of the wicked. Now, what a great little encapsulation of all the Proverbs. In fact, the more you read Proverbs, you realize how much Solomon has to say about a couple of things. Sluggards, fools mockers, wise, righteous, those who listen to their mother and father. Those groups of people appear throughout the book. So it's not strange that he begins his uh, small couplets here with this idea. A wise son makes a glad father. Now that really cuts both ways, doesn't it? We as fathers need to make sure that we take our spiritual leadership seriously. Uh, we, we need to do the kind of things to be a Christian example uh, to our children, and then uh, children. You know, I think sometimes we almost let our kids off the hook in uh, their responsibility here. Realize, as a child, that God wants you to be pleasing to Him by be pleasing to your parents. And then in verse 3, I think this echoes our time pretty well. It says, The Lord does not let the righteous go hungry. You know, there are lots of things we could say and have said uh, about this uh, period of social isolation. <laughs> Isolation, I tried to say. Uh, social distancing and not being able to meet together uh, in our assembly halls. Well, we still need to remember that we may have local members of churches that are in need. That there may be members of our congregations who lose their jobs. Who, who may not be able to work or whatever the case may be. The church needs to be there. 
The book of Acts tells us there were no needy Christians among them. It is the responsibility of local church to take care of the benevolent needs of its members. Let's make sure that in this time our light shines. Let's make sure if we have elders in our congregations that they're doing shepherd work, that they're checking on the flock, that they're, they're making sure that if there's anyone in need that we alleviate that need. And that, that gets back to the idea of why do we lay by in store? We lay by in store for just a time as this. You know, we read that verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 1 and 3 a lot. And one of the things that Paul says there is, he says, uh, to lay by in store on the first day of the week, that there be no collections when I come. Now, Paul is referring there to his personal coming to Corinth, or uh, maybe even ascending of uh, Titus or Timothy uh, to come for him. But what he's talking about there is, churches need to store up treasuries to deal with situations just like this. Whether the situation be giving uh, to the needy in Jerusalem, as they were talking about there in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, or whether they be in a situation like this, when we may be separated, our contributions may be down, and we have, may have members of our congregations who are out of work. Well, well, their needs need to be fulfilled. One of the ways that we do that is in our contribution. And we, we talk all the time about spreading the gospel and sending the light with the things that we do, as well we should, because that's certainly a big part of it. But never ever overlook the fact that when we contribute to the church where we're members, that we are providing for so that when desperation comes, when the situation comes, that there is no need of a collection, that we can make sure that we do those things. So when uh, Solomon says in Proverbs 10 and 3, the Lord does not let the righteous go hungry, that God is doing that. When God gives us these commands to do these things, God knows what he's talking about. When God says to lay by in store so that if there's a need, we can take care of it, he is making sure through his inspired word and through his inspired will that we do his work. Amen. Well, for now, we'll look at verse 4. And this gets back to the kind of general themes that Solomon deals with in the book of Proverbs. He says, a, sa a slack hand causes poverty, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. He who gathers in summer is a prudent son, but he who sleeps in harvest is a son who brings shame. The book of Proverbs has a lot to say about the idea that we need to work hard and make a living. And we don't need to be sorry. We, we don't need to be the kind of man who lays at home and doesn't support his family. And the other thing there is, when he's talking about gathering in summer and sleeping in harvest, we have to put the work in. We can't expect the results in our life if we're not willing uh, to put in the effort. Uh, when a farmer uh, gets ready to harvest, he's done a lot of things that, up to that point. He's plowed the ground, he's planted, he's weeded, he's watered, he's done all these things. He doesn't just get to the harvest day and say, well, let's wander out here and, and pick up what we can find. Those things have taken effort, and we need to do the same thing as Christians and in our individual personal life as well. Now, verse 9, Proverbs chapter 2. We're in Proverbs chapter 10, this whole segment. Whoever walks in integrity walks securely, but he who makes his ways crooked will be found out. Whoever winks the eye causes trouble, and a babbling fool will come to ruin. We need to realize that we need to do the right thing. If you do the right thing, that will be found out. If you do the wrong thing, that will be found out. Do you want to have no fear of people hearing what you say, no fear of people knowing what you do? Then do the right thing. There's a great peace that comes in living the Christian life and being able to live an open life and say, what I've done, you can find out. And just real briefly, uh, let's think about this within our electronic lives. Uh, I'm holding up my phone that you can see on video right there. These things are dangerous, and we need to make sure, especially for married uh, men and women, uh, that we share everything with our spouse. My wife can have my phone at any time and look through anything on it, and vice versa. Uh, our lives need to be that way, because if we're walking in integrity, we're walking securely. Verse 12 now. Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all offenses. Amen. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 8 says that love covers a multitude of sins. Well, hatred stirs them up. Hatred won't forgive them. What great words that we need to live by. Verse 23 now, doing wrong is a joke to a fool. Man, oh man, is that ever true? We live in a world where sin is a joke. 
uh, where sin is celebrated. There's nothing new under the sun. Solomon says, doing wrong is a joke to a fool, but wisdom is pleasure to a man of understanding. And finally, from Proverbs chapter 10, like vinegar to the teeth and smoke to the eyes, so is the sluggard to those who send him. Solomon is telling us 3,000 years ago that if you can't depend on a man, uh, that makes your life terrible. <laughs> it's just the way it goes, right? We know this in our family relationships. We know this in our husband and wife relationship. We know this in our church relationship. We know it in our jobs. We know it in our government. If you can't be relied on, you're, you're, just, you're just more trouble than you're worth. It was true then, it's true now. So what's the message? Don't be that guy. Don't be the sluggard. Be reliable. Be someone that your family can rely on, your church can rely on. Be a pillar in your community. That's what we're looking for. That's what wisdom brings the Christian. Amen? Amen. All right, we'll stick around. We're going to talk about some hypotheticals of baptism. Plus, we're going to ask the question in the next segment, what is the point? Why, why worship anyway? Why, why talk about the Lord's Supper? Why worry about any of this? We'll answer those questions when we come back with Grace and Truth. Most people want the bad news first. So here it is. We have all sinned and deserve the wrath of God. But the good news is Jesus shed his blood and paid the price for our salvation. God gave us a sign of eternal life by raising him from the dead. His resurrection proves he's the Son of God, Christ my Lord. Come to him in faith. Be born again of water and the Spirit. Serve him and he will save you. That is the message of God. We are his servants at the North 2nd Street Church of Christ. Find out more at northsecondcfc.org. Chris, you're not acting like a grown-up in our relationship. M2, M2. There's your comic book collection, the race car bed. I'm young at heart, but I put money into my 401k every paycheck. I'm taking control over my financial life, and that feels pretty grown-up to me. Put away a few bucks, feel like a million bucks. For free ideas and easy ways to save, go to feedthepig.org. That's feedthepig.org. Are those footy pajamas? This message brought to you by the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants and the Ad Council. James 127 is a clear directive for Christians to help widows and orphans. We do very well helping widows, but what about orphans? Many Christian families would love to adopt, but cannot afford the twenty-five to thirty thousand dollar cost. Sacred Selections is a nonprofit foundation designed to help. One hundred percent of your donations go directly to help finance an adoption. Sacred Selections has helped one hundred nineteen families adopt children. SacredSelections.org helping Christians help the helpless. You're struggling with your mortgage. You think about it all the time. What are we going to do if we lose the house? It's time to stop thinking and start dialing. Call 1-888-995-HOPE for a free government program that offers expert one-on-one -on -one advice about your mortgage options. We've helped over a million homeowners, and we want to help you. Call 1-888-995-HOPE or visit makinghomeaffordable.gov. Brought to you by the U.S. Treasury, HUD, and the Ad Council. Welcome back into Grace and Truth. We come your way on the Lord's Day at 8 a.m. on 105.1 FM and at 11 a.m. on 105.5 FM and 1400 a.m. The Wolf. All right, my name is Jason Sage. I'm the minister with the North 2nd Street Church of Christ. You're always welcome to join us, even if we're online. Find us on Facebook. We are live with our Bible study and worship periods. Uh, just put in your search bar, North 2nd. Uh, spell that out, S-E-C-O-N-D, North 2nd Street, Church of Christ, uh, and check out our uh, live uh, Bible study and worship services. All right, coming up a little bit later on the show, and I'm excited about this segment. We're going to talk about uh, baptism hypotheticals. Uh, and if you've ever talked to somebody about religious issues, you've probably run into a few of these. I, I literally ran into one of them this week. I'm actually going to quote uh, from a message I got from a real good friend of mine. Uh, we disagree on religious things, but... Uh, a great guy, a great friend of mine. So we'll talk about that coming up in the next segment. But right now, I want to deal with what is the point? And i tell you what I mean by this. Uh, there's been quite a bit said and done. And, and I think there's the, the instinct for this is good because as many of our congregations, including us at North 2nd Street, have transitioned to online worship, 
there are a lot of questions that come up. How, what about the Lord's Supper? What about singing? What about contributing? What or should we even do it? How, maybe should we meet in our homes? Uh, maybe we should defy uh, the suggestions of the government and meet anyway. And on and on and on. And you, you've seen those kind of things on social media or you've talked to people about them. Well, I think in some ways, and, and, I'm, and I'm not saying we shouldn't think about those things, that the instinct that we want to be right before God, that we take things of God seriously, uh, and we don't just willy-nilly enter into what we're doing, that's a positive. So please don't misunderstand my reaction here. But I think sometimes we forget what the point is. And i tell you what I mean by that. What is the point of worship anyway? Why are we coming together? The, the opposite side of that coin, by the way, is those who might say, well, you know, I can just roll out of bed and catch a church online. In fact, I guess if I've got my phone, I don't even have to roll out of bed. I can just uh, check out the live stream and I'm good. Because, and that's the fear for a lot of us about what will happen uh, when we go back uh, to meeting. Well, all, all of that misses the point. Because there are things, we talked about groaning to be together. There are things about our worship service together that have a point. There is a reason why Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25 exists. There is a reason that we do those things because we are to be together to encourage one another. So what is the point of our worship? Is it just something we're doing to prove our loyalty to God? Is it just something we're doing because it's a command that we have to assemble? If I look at it that way, I'm wrong as well. So what is the point, preacher man? The point is all the benefits that happen when we worship together. Let me give you a few verses. And I'll start with Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28 through 29. Hebrews 12, 28 through 29. The word of God says this. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, For our God is a consuming fire. The point of our worship service is to glorify God, to humble ourselves, to elevate God, to put ourselves second, to be reminded that there is a God, and that to hear preaching and teaching, to hear scripture reading, to hear prayer, those things elevate God. They put me in my place. They help me forget about the things of this world. It's been such Such a relief for me personally, with all that's going on, to have our little online sessions and and to kind of go into our cocoon for two hours on Sunday morning and an hour on Wednesday night and just think about God and just think about the church. What a blessing that is to elevate God, to treat him with respect. That's the point of our worship service. So not only does our worship service have a point because it glorifies God, but it has a point for each other. Colossians 3.16 says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Did you notice that phrase, teaching and admonishing one another? One of the reasons we come together, one of the reasons we sing, is we teach and we admonish. That's something that happens when we come together as a group. And when we come together as a group, we also declare the glory of God. Did you realize that? If Christians come together of different races and different ethnic backgrounds and different financial backgrounds, if we come together and we worship in peace and we glorify God to one another, we are declaring the wisdom of God to the world. Look at what Paul says in Ephesians 3. He says, so that through the church, now if you're familiar With Ephesians chapter 3, Paul is talking about here this idea that Jews and Gentiles, long adversaries, are being brought together and that this bringing together of both Jew and Gentile in one body, that that shows how great God is. Here's the text again. So that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. When churches come together in peace, We declare that there is a God and he is one. So that's the point of worship. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 16 talks about the Lord's Supper, and there's been quite a bit said about the Lord's Supper in this time. But don't forget this. Our doing it has a purpose. 1 Corinthians 11, 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim 
the Lord's death until he comes. So think about just those verses. What do they tell us? Our worship shows that we're reverent and in awe of God. Our worship and our singing together come so that we may teach and admonish. Our worship declares to the world that God is one and God is powerful and God's love can overcome uh, any differences between mankind. And when we partake of the Lord's Supper, we are declaring that Jesus Christ died on the cross. Why come together? What's the point? That's the point. And let me close with this. The other point is this. When we meet together virtually, we need to remember that we may be isolated in our homes. We may not be joining together uh, in a church building. But where we are, God is. And where God is, worship can occur. Jesus deals with this in John chapter 4 with the woman at the well. Of course, uh, Jesus has asked her a hard question, and she doesn't want to talk about that. So she says, let me ask this kind of riddle of Jesus. Where should we worship? On the mount of Mount Gerizim where the Samaritans worship or in Jerusalem? So Jesus answers that question with an explanation about God. John 4 and verse 21. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here. When the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. Verse 24 now. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. What is Jesus saying? Jesus is saying that you worship where you are. Who is to worship? Children of God. Where are they to worship? Wherever they may find themselves. Because where you are, God is. We talk about the omniscience, the omnipresence, and the all power, the omnipotent nature, omnipotent, excuse me, nature of God, that he is all-knowing and all-seeing and all-powerful, that he's all-present. Well, that's true. There are, there are reasons we, we talk about those things. Because in understanding that God is everywhere, is comforting to us because where we are, God is with us. And we can be one with God and therefore one with each other. Let's make sure during this trying time that we maintain our church relationship as best we can. It's not preferable and we groan for it to change. But let's maintain our church life. Let's maintain our regular schedule of Bible study and worship. And let's remember when we come out on the other side, there's a point to our worship. There's a point to our worship when we do it online. Those points all remain. In fact, if you uh, come and and join us with a worship service at North 2nd Street, the the only difference is not in what we do, but how many people do it. Right? We, We don't have an entire congregation singing, which is unfortunate because you have to listen to me sing from time to time. We don't have an entire congregation of men to come and serve the table and read and pray and do those things. But we're doing the same thing together at the same time. Because all these things have a point to glorify God, edify one another, to declare the death of Jesus Christ till he comes, to to prove to the world that people can come and live in peace and harmony, that we can worship God, that our God is great, and where we are, God is. Amen? Let's say a brief prayer. Our Lord, our God, we come to you in this period of trial in our country this period of trial for our churches. Lord, and we ask first of all that that you be with the leaders of our country and our states and our local areas, that you give them wisdom, that you help them to seek not themselves but the needs of their citizens, that they be given wisdom to do the things that will cause the least harm, that we can be brought back to some semblance of normal. And Lord, we pray for our churches, We pray for those in positions of leadership, that they do wise things, that when we come back together, Lord, that we may sing praises to your name, that we may be joined together in reality and in flesh and in spirit, 
We long for that, Lord. We ask and beg that it happen. We ask, Lord, for the secular needs of this world, for the health of those who are dealing with these things. We have members, Lord, even of our congregations who are dealing with this dreaded virus. Lord, please heal them. Be with those that are around them. Help them not to get sick, and if they do, to heal them. Please be with all those who are facing uh, this disease in ways that their their jobs force them to, Healthcare workers and even those that we may not think of as being on the front lines, as uh, people that work in our grocery stores and who are supplying uh, food, the drive through and drop-off services, and, and on and on and on, and policemen and first responders and all those who have a responsibility to go out and meet the public and do those things, those essential businesses that we talk about so much, Lord. We pray for their health. Please be with us as churches. Help us to love each other. Help us to resist the temptation to blame. Help us to resist the temptation to to be frustrated and to be angry with one another. Help us to love. Help us to forgive. Help us to heal. We beg all these things, Lord, and we long to be together one day as a church, and we long, Lord, to be together with you in that true family relationship in heaven. We ask all these things because of and in the name of the blood of Jesus Christ and through the Spirit you've given us. Amen. Lord, we ask that you be with us, and we ask that you stay with us on Grace and Truth. We're going to talk about baptism hypotheticals. What about all those questions? We'll talk about it when we come back with more Grace and Truth. James 127 is a clear directive for Christians to help widows and orphans. We do very well helping widows, but what about orphans? Many Christian families would love to adopt, but cannot afford the $25,000 to $30,000 cost. Sacred Selections is a nonprofit foundation designed to help. 100% of your donations go directly to help finance an adoption. Sacred Selections has helped 119 families adopt children. SacredSelections.org, helping Christians help the helpless. Mommy, why are we going to the store? Mom, Mom I want Mommy. juice. Mom, juice, 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 Mommy, juice, juice, juice. Mom. Juice, juice, juice. Your child will have different needs at different stages of life, and that includes the car seat. That's right, the car seat. A car seat isn't one size fits all. You have to have the right seat based on your child's age, weight, and height. See, car crashes are a leading killer of children ages 1 to 13. But there's a website that gives you all the information you need. Safercar.gov slash the right seat. You'll find out about types of seats, when to have a seat rear facing, when to switch it to forward facing, when it's time for a booster seat, and when it's time for your child to ride in the back seat with a seat belt. Protect your child's future at every stage of life. Go to safercar.gov slash the right seat. That's safercar.gov slash the right seat. A message from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. In the Bible, the word for church simply means a group of people. The Church of Christ that meets on North 2nd Street in Clarksville is just that. We're a group of people spreading the love of Jesus, worshiping God, and seeking Him through His Spirit-revealed Word. Our Bible studies are simple and offered for all ages. Our worship is intended to praise God and encourage His saints. Our worship starts at 10 and 5 on the Lord's Day. Find out more at northsecondcfc.org. Find the love of Jesus at the North 2nd Street Church of Christ. This is Grace and Truth Radio. Find us on social media. We're on Facebook at Grace and Truth 1400, or you can find us on the Twitter machine at Grace Truth 1400. All right, welcome back into the show. Thank you for being with us. Uh, we are glad that you are here. Uh, just a real quick reminder uh, that if you're interested in joining our live worship services from the North 2nd Street Church of Christ, uh, you can also find us on Facebook. Uh, just put North 2nd, spell out 2nd, S-E-C-O-N-D, North 2nd Street Church of Christ, and uh, go on our Facebook page and you can see our worship. You can join us all live in our worship service there. All right, I want to talk about something that literally came up uh, in a message from a dear friend of mine. Uh, and I'm, I'm guessing he will uh, probably listen to the show a little bit later on. He, he's he's a, a great guy, and I enjoy talking to him very much. I'm very jealous uh, to have him and his family as members at North 2nd Street. I just haven't uh, been able to kind of quite get him in the right headlock. Uh, but one day it'll happen. But he, he can't help, or he, he can help, <laughs> uh, that he's a Calvinist. He is a faith-only 
uh, guy. Uh, we've had so many talks about this on and on and on. And uh, there are other things that uh, we disagree on, uh, but we're good friends. And he sent me uh, this hypothetical. This, this, I was actually asking him about something completely different. Uh, and he uh, uh, came back and asked me a question. I guess maybe it had been on his mind. So I'm going to read it to you. You've heard something similar to this. We're going to read his question, and then we'll talk about it. Okay, here it is. He says, so someone accepts the gospel invitation online. Everyone is quarantined. A minister, neighbor, or friend is not able to fully immerse, or they don't have a bathtub. No way for immersion. Are they saved? Now, you might sit there if you've never heard those kind of things. You go, oh, that's a really good question. Well, it's not as good of a question as, as he thinks it is. <laughs> <laughs> and and he and he and again this is this is nothing that uh, he doesn't know so don't feel don't feel bad for this young man uh, I'm not saying anything I wouldn't say to his face uh, so I I sent him back a question that was similar I said if someone gets hit by a train on the way to a service where they would accept Jesus into their heart are they saved and really this gets down uh, to the heart of the matter right is is there a condition that man must meet for salvation. And this is really where the rubber meets the road on this. This this is an old question. What happens if someone comes down the aisle and confesses Christ and they have a heart attack before they get in the baptistry? Well, first of all, all that's whittling on God's end of the stick. That's copyright for Robert Turner from about 1960 some odd. We just don't, we, we, we can't know those things. And these questions are designed to put doubt in our mind when really the thing we should worry about is what can we do I can't do anything about it if somebody dies uh, before we can get them in the baptistry. I just I can't do anything about that. What I can do something about is I can obey God where he's given us clear commands. But the other thing is this, and I think this is what my faith-only friends don't realize when they ask this question. Uh, sometimes uh, they're, they're uh, cutting the throat of their own argument by what they say. Because if they say to me, will you... Uh, you are, uh, you know, you're a gospel preacher who believes that you have to be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, that you're not a Christian until uh, you're immersed in water as a believer. Well, amen, first of all. That's, that's true. So they, they, because that's a difference between what they teach and what we teach, that hurts their feelings, right? So they, they want to find a way to justify themselves. So they come up with a hypothetical. Well, the same hypothetical could be applied to what they believe. And here's, I've already mentioned this, but let's ask it again. Is there any condition, in other words, a thing that a person must do, is there any condition a person must meet to be saved? If so, what happens if they don't meet that condition? Because what my faith-only friends forget is they have conditions too. Okay? Is there anyone among us who would say that a person has, does not have to believe to be saved? Is that what they would say? Would they agree to that statement? I don't think so. Would they say that they have to repent? I'm certain that they would. Would they say that they have to confess Jesus is Lord? Well, if, if those things are conditions, what's the difference between that as a condition and baptism as a condition? As far as this scenario about you know who has a heart attack before they get to the building uh, to confess faith in Christ or who has a heart attack before they're baptized, there, there's no difference. And the, and the questions are really moot because the idea is, now, should I have faith? Amen. Should I repent as soon as possible? Should I confess Jesus Christ as Lord? Why not already? And the same applies to immersion baptism. Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10 uh, sets these conditions on confession and baptism just as sure, excuse me, uh, confession and faith just as surely as we do on baptism. Romans chapter 10 says, Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Amen, by the way. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. So there's no difference here in conditions. Uh, our hypothetical friends are just picking the condition they want to pick. And the other problem here is, when we start thinking about all these hypotheticals, you know what we're not talking about? The scriptures. Because I don't teach anything. Churches of Christ, quote-unquote, don't teach anything. What the Bible says is what matters. And this is where the rubber really meets the road. Be because 
so many of my uh, Calvinist uh, friends, they, they have issues amongst themselves uh, about this, about whether you have the more hardcore uh, Calvinists that be- they, they truly believe there's no condition a man meets. They believe that God chooses the saved and the damned and on and on and on. But most of what we would know as faith-only Christians uh, that, that those of us in this area are familiar with, what those people would say that you have to have faith, you have to do something, uh, whether they've made it up in the sinner's prayer or uh, the kind of uh, accept Jesus into your heart. None of that's found in the Bible, by the way. And that's the problem. As I heard a preacher say one time, you know, the Word of God sure can shed a lot of light on these commentaries sometimes. Well, that's true. Because in all these things that we're talking about, we're not talking about the Scriptures. And when we come back to the Scriptures, and we all know the verses, right? Matthew 28, 18, uh, 28, 18 through 20, Mark 16, 16, Acts 2, 38, 1 Peter 3, 21, Acts 22, 16, Why tarriest thou arise and be baptized, washing away your sins. We all know all those verses, John 3 and verse 5. But I want to take one verse and look at it and ask the question, when am I free from sin? Because that's really the question. Because would anyone argue that as long as I'm enslaved to sin, I'm saved? Would anyone argue that as long as I'm alive to sin, I'm going to heaven? Well, when do I die to sin? Let's read Romans chapter 6, verse 17 and 18 first, and then we're going to back up in that same chapter. Paul says this through the Holy Spirit. But thanks be to God that you were once slaves of sin. Okay, what's my condition there? Unsaved have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed, and having been set free from sin, have become slaves to righteousness. Now we know what the last verse of this chapter says, right? The free gift of God is eternal life for those who have become slaves of righteousness. So the difference here in Romans chapter 6 is the one who's still a slave to sin the one who's, versus the one who's been set free from sin. Well, when and how does that occur? Would anyone argue that while I'm a slave to sin, I'm saved? Would anyone argue that before I'm set free from sin, I'm saved? Would you? Careful how you answer. Let's back up to verse 3. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin, for one who has died has been set free from sin. So when am I set free from sin? When am I a slave to righteousness? Mm, that's right. When I die with Christ in baptism and I'm raised again to walk in newness of life. So let's do away with these silly hypotheticals. Let's do away with the what ifs. What do we know we should do? Should I put my faith in Jesus Christ as the Christ, the Son of God, resurrected, ascended, glorified? Amen. Does he have a kingdom I should begin to serve in? Yes. Should I repent and turn from a life lived in unbelief and turn to live a life of faith? Amen, I should. Should I confess him as Lord? We've already read that verse. Should I submit to him in baptism? Should I die to sin? Should I live to righteousness? Can I? Should I? How do I? by being buried with Jesus in baptism and walking in newness of life. Don't hesitate. As we've already proven here in the last couple of weeks, there's no hindrance on the gospel. If baptism is what you need, if salvation is what you desire, we'll find a way. We'll, we'll find a bathtub. We'll find a baptistry. We'll find a creek. We'll make it happen. We will obey God when and as we should. Because those who believe and are immersed, have their sins washed away, are dead to sin and alive to righteousness. What a free gift we have coming, eternal life with God forever. Amen? Amen. Stick around with us. We'll come back and wrap up the show with more grace and truth. Most people want the bad news first. 
So here it is. We have all sinned and deserve the wrath of God. But the good news is, Jesus shed his blood and paid the price for our salvation. God gave us a sign of eternal life by raising him from the dead. His resurrection proves he's the Son of God, Christ my Lord. Come to him in faith. Be born again of water and the Spirit. Serve him and he will save you. That is the message of God. We are his servants at the North 2nd Street Church of Christ. Find out more at northsecondcfc.org. Dad, this is fun. I didn't think I'd like kayaking. Well, I'm glad you enjoyed it. But I think it's time to head back in. Okay. Can we come back? Sure. Tomorrow? <laughs> Let's check with Mom. Hey, be careful getting out of the boat. It's a kayak, Dad. <laughs> I'm going to return the kayak. Let's make sure you have everything. Yep. Can we walk home? Yeah, how about a taxi? 233 North Maple, please. It's a short fare from your neighborhood to your naturehood. Visit discovertheforest.org to find a neighborhood park or green space near you. Also, find fun activities to do like boating and biking or camping and hiking. Plus, much more. It's all right in your naturehood. Best day ever. A public service announcement brought to you by the Ad Council and the U.S. Forest Service. James 127 is a clear directive for Christians to help widows and orphans. We do very well helping widows, but what about orphans? Many Christian families would love to adopt, but cannot afford the $25,000 to $30,000 cost. Sacred Selections is a nonprofit foundation designed to help. 100% of your donations go directly to help finance an adoption. Sacred Selections has helped 119 families adopt children. SacredSelections.org, helping Christians help the helpless. Grace and Truth Radio is on Facebook. Find us at Grace and Truth 1400. And you can find us at Twitter. Tweet at us at Grace Truth 1400. All right, it's been so good to be back with you today. I uh, hope that the show has been a blessing to you. As always, if you have questions or comments, get in touch with us on social media. Uh, I promise you this uh, if you ask a question on our Facebook page, we will get to it, we will deal with it. Uh, we certainly want to be accessible to you as best we can. Or if you just have a Bible question or, or maybe a subject or a topic that you would like to see us discuss, uh, please get in touch with us. I can't know what you're thinking. I can't know the thing that you would like to ask until you do. So uh, get in touch with us there. And, and let me kind of apologize a little bit. I've been a little excited today. Uh, it's good to be back with everybody. I'm like everybody else. I've been stoved up in the house with my wife and my kids from time to time. And they don't listen to me. And the dog is even maybe thinking about... Uh, running away when I talk to him. So it's good to be back here and, and get to talk to you. So thank you for being with us. Uh, as always, before we leave you, uh, we want to go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Our God, our Father, the great I Am, the creator and sustainer of this world, Lord, you are our Savior. You sent your Son. Lord, you guide this world we know that no matter what may happen, that we live in a world of sin and death. That there are evil forces arrayed against us. That they may do things in our lives that cause us pain. But Lord, we know you are sovereign above it all. We know that you will save us. We know that you will bring us to live with you in the end. And we groan inside in our spirit and with yours for that day. Praise your name. Lord, we ask for our country. Please be with us, be with our leaders, be with those who are suffering from this illness, be with the family members who are dealing with it, with the health care workers, be with all those who are suffering through loss of employment or loss of job or even the idea that those who are having to serve in ways that are made dangerous by their uh, being exposed to the public, Lord, please be with them all. And Lord, please be with our churches. Be with us as individual Christians. Help us to maintain our our spiritual thoughts, our ideas of you. Help us to remember to study your word. Help us to remember to join together. Please bless our churches as we come out of this. Help us to grow, Lord. Make this trial a blessing. We know that you can. Lord, I'm reminded of those who are separated from us. 
there in our congregation, we've lost many in the recent six months or so. I'm reminded of one of our dear early listeners who's passed away recently. I think of her and her family. Lord, we ask that you be with them in this time. And Lord, we thank you for those who come and join with us on this program who help support us so that we may spread the gospel. Lord, help them to know that we appreciate their efforts and that we thank them for what they do for us. Lord, we beg that you forgive us of our sins. Cleanse us, Lord. Fill us with your spirit. Help us to know that you are God. Help us to flee from the sins that put Jesus on the cross. We praise your name. It is through Jesus, our high priest, that we pray. We come to you in spirit. We call you our Father. Amen. All right, that's going to do it for us today. Thank you for being with us on the show. Uh, I know it's trying time. Uh, Again, uh, let me remind, I can't implore you enough. If your congregation is doing virtual services, assemble together with them. Uh, Support that. Let's support uh, the leaders in our churches, the elders in our churches. Let's let them know we're behind them. Are they making difficult decisions? Yes. Are they just doing the best they can? Yes. Let's get out there and let them know that we love them and we appreciate them. We've grown to be back together in person. i grown to be back with you next week. Lord willing, we will be. And you know the drill. Hey, man, you can still brush your teeth and put on your shoes. Join us on Facebook Live. We'll see you then. And we'll see you back here next week with more Grace and Truth.